Good afternoon and welcome to today's Ask Me Anything with Dr. Will Roper. Today we have some exciting things to address, specifically talking today about how we are going to move forward in deep tech, looking at these potential sky shots, looking to see how new government partnerships might be able to close some of the gaps between baby steps and giant leaps. And so to talk us through that, we've got here Dr. Will Roper, we also have a fantastic opportunity for you to start submitting your questions. We've already seen some of those come across on social media. Uh, we'll be gathering those throughout, uh, and it'll be your chance, actually, to ask Dr. Roper anything. So, Dr. Roper, welcome, and over to you. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Vidoff. And uh, hello, everyone. Hopefully, you're all having a, a good and safe Monday, and really appreciate the great response that we got from the last Ask Me Anything. AFWORKS is an amazing organization for the Air Force and the Space Force and helping us learn how to, how to be partners with you in commercial technology. So we're excited to be back because the overwhelming request that we got from both companies and private investors is we've heard you talk about the process that AFWORKS and AFVENTURES have, and you've done an entire Ask Me Anything to highlight that process to help us understand it. But we want to talk more about the areas of technologies themselves. And I couldn't be more delighted to talk about technology. That's truly what I love doing, why I come to work every day. And so when I was talking with the AFWORKS team, you know, we had a great discussion that we thought would be worth bringing you in, which is how should the military, how should the government engage in a long-term relationship with private innovators. We've been working over the past two and a half years to just show you that we can be a partner you can trust and to have a process that doesn't require you to get a PhD in government to work with us. And hopefully if you're watching this, you've started to believe that we really do have that earnest desire to be your government partner of choice and to have a process that you can write on a bar napkin and share with your friends. But what are we interested in and what would be our delineated value proposition in the commercial tech ecosystem long term? And that's what got us talking uh, about deep tech and this idea of a sky shot. Now, a moonshot, we've we all heard of. We, that's a great term. We all want to go for the moon. These crazy ideas that are not likely to succeed but in daring them, we're likely to learn. And we want to do moonshots within AFWORKS. We do have Space Force after all. But in talking with private investors, an overwhelming response that we got, especially from investors who have been around since Silicon Valley was founded, is that the Valley's changed and that, and that private investment has changed. And it's migrated more and more away from deeper forms of technology that require more time and energy to bring to fruition and has migrated into areas of digital technology that are de-risk and the returns on investments are realized more quickly. And AI is certainly the first thing you think of, but there are many fields of technology that are digitally driven, autonomy, et cetera. And that, that is where about 80% of private investment has migrated to. Well, as we enter in to this ecosystem as a military investor, we have a very different investment calculus than our private investment colleagues do. We can be patient. We can go after areas of deep tech and help fill the gap 
between a de-risk baby step and a moonshot that's shooting for the heavens, something that is going to get you off the ground and help you take flight, but is not going for something so radical that it's a once in a hundred, once in a thousand chance of succeeding. And since we are an Air Force, we thought a sky shot was a good name, deeper areas of tech and sustained investment. And so there are many areas that come to mind for me, and I, I hope that you'll get us your questions and we can chat about areas that you want to hear. What does the Air Force, what does the Space Force think about that technology being used in operations? How high on our priority list would it be? What missions might we see being applicable for it? How might we engage to help you get them to the goal line? And I'm happy to share just a couple in opening remarks, but I really want to hear from your questions. Uh, you know, I, we were thinking, well, we'd love to talk about those areas, but we have a low hanging opportunity in front of us. And you probably heard, I've talked about it. We've talked about it. Uh, Colonel Diller is the champion of our flying car program, Agility Prime. And we realized Agility Prime was an area of the Air Force going after a deeper form of technology. This was a, a market that we could accelerate, but it's gonna require a little more investment a little more regulatory de-risking, and an Air Force uh, has a lot of know-how in uh, de-risking things that need to fly. And the response, as we have become a concerted investor, over $100 million from the government now moving into this market, and the return in terms of enthusiasm from companies investors have been overwhelming. We've realized this is something that we shouldn't just do with flying cars because it's cool that Agility Prime should spawn a whole series of prime programs, all of which are focusing on an area of deep tech, helping companies and investors in those arenas to shoot for the skies with help from the government to get off the ground and stay off the ground. And so we're interested to know what the next prime program should be. And I hope that we'll discuss it today. And at the end, I'll post my Twitter handle up. I'm going to send out a poll and, and let you engage, let you vote on areas that you think the Air Force and Space Force could be most helpful in making that next deep tech leak leap happen. So a lot of the areas you can probably guess are hardware focused, but I'm interested in knowing, you know, what's driving you? What's your company working on? What are you invested in? How would you like to see us engage? So today is an opportunity to talk about technology itself and how the military can use it. But this is an ask me anything. So if there is another itch we've got to scratch for you, then please get us your questions. And just thank you again for, for joining us and for helping us continue to become an investment partner that you can trust. Super. Well, I think one of the first questions that we've had is, obviously, this is important technology, important that the United States do this work. But there's been kind of this ongoing, what does it look like to inter engage the international communities? We look to our partners, where's the deep tech and what does that collaboration look like with the international partners? You know, great question, Colonel Diller. And I'll tell you, we, we need your thoughts on engaging internationally. We are about to have our first foray into international co-investment with International Space Pitch Day with the United Kingdom. Now, if you want to know why we haven't taken that bold leap, part of it is because of how our investment account, Small Business Innovative Research, or SBIR, is set up. It, it's by law focused on U.S.-only companies, and we are certainly pro-U.S. companies within the Air Force and Space Force. But look, tech is global. Opportunities are global. And if companies around the world aren't working with us, they could easily be working with our competitors. So we need to take the innovation battlefield outside of our homeland and wherever good ideas are found. So International Space Pitch Day, which is going to take place in November, is our first foray to working with uh, allied governments, partner governments, to invest together in companies in, in their own nations. And this is something I want to break out of our traditional partners into the developing world as well. Um, we realize that the places that you think of as hotbeds for tech, uh, they are, but they're not alone. Technology is emerging so many areas around the world 
especially in digital domains, and, and we're simply absent. If there's not an air base near there, we are likely absent. So one thing I'm going to be doing immediately after Space Pitch Day is working with Congress to see if we can broaden our ability to work with international companies. Uh, SBIR is the only account that's limited by law. So we have other accounts in the Air Force and Space Force we should be using. And so I'm going to be working with Colonel Diller and his team to determine what our international investment strategy is. And if you know that there is a hotbed of tech that we ought to be leveraging for our missions, we'd love to hear from you. So we'll make sure at the end you also have the link to, to AFWORKS website so that you can get us ideas on how we can go engage internationally. And it's very much the mindset we want, is that the entire world, the entire globe of tech is a battlefield in and of itself. And it, it's taking the long view to think of it as a battlefield. You may think, well, Will, yeah, if a country and nation X, Y, or Z develops that technology first without your help and without connection to you, so what for the US Air Force? Well, that, that's probably true in the near term. But how long would that be true if more and more technology grows up without connection to us? What guarantees that we're going to have access to it? What if it's that next leap ahead opportunity? And what if during that leap ahead opportunities time period, our hand is called and our Air Force is needed for global stability or national security? That's the risk we face. Things are too volatile and adaptive right now for us to risk not having connection with innovators. So there's a little bit of follow-up. As you look at some of the international innovation, are there particular areas, particular technologies that you think are, are better suited for that international partnership? You know, I mean, I don't want to put any limits on it, but the entire world is working on artificial intelligence and its next instantiation that will most likely go on moving things in the Internet of Things where there are more safety or or security concerns. And boy, uh, do we have moving things in our quote internet. So we need good ideas uh, along those lines. Autonomy, drones are areas we see that broad participation. Um, but we're also interested in just fundamental areas of, of science. Materials continue to be fascinating to us in the Air Force. And we've really taken uh, the, the megaphone away from our voice that we are a service that loves breakthroughs on materials. So to be frank, if you're building it and it has an amazing breakthrough potential in any field of technology, there is a mission application for the U.S. Air Force. And what I hope in future is that getting that idea to us is easy and working with us to bring it to fruition is easier still. And if that ends up being our next chapter, boy, are we in a good place to win on that innovation battlefield. It's just very different than how we're postured today. We're still mainly working inside the defense industrial base with a handful of defense primes. Not their fault. That's how we do business. But we've got to do business globally to compete and win. So no holds barred, no artificial limits placed on what we want to do. Uh, best ideas ought to get the the best attention from us. So our next question, uh, a reference to General Brown's Accelerate Change. We've talked about this a bit. Do you see the department being able to actually scale this approach to capability? Where does this fit into Accelerate Change? And in particular, what is, what is the pace that you think scalability is possible here? Great question. So if you haven't heard Chief Brown's talk on accelerate change or lose, boy, that, that could not fit better with what I think about engaging in global tech. And I'm glad he put the word lose in because that's what's at stake. Um, I think Hap Arnold said an Air Force is always endangered of becoming obsolete. And that speaks to what happens if you're not, if you're not adapting, if you're not changing. If you're not adapting in the ecosystem, then you're one meteor away uh, from being extinct. And that's how we feel right now in the volatile time of technology change that meteors are coming and that we need to be ready to adapt and not become extinct. So Chief Brown is driving this. So to your point, Vidoff, what's the real litmus test on whether we're going to become adaptable? Uh, we've got to get the work we're doing in AFWorks where we don't think of it as innovation. 
right? That's how what everyone says about AFWERX. What what an innovative organization! It's imperative. This work we're doing with commercial innovators is imperative. This is needed so that we don't lose. And if you want to know what's the litmus test for that, if we decide it's imperative and not innovation, that means that we fund it. And so for the companies that are the first classes of AFWERX companies going through our phase one, phase two, and again, congratulations to all the Stratfi companies. The litmus test is whether if you succeed, whether we get you to a steady state contract so that we benefit long-term from your tech and so do you, and hopefully uh, help you to commercialize and have found working within the military market a delineated advantage compared to your competitors who are not working with us. That's the litmus test that determines, are we still innovating or is this imperative? So following up on that, specifically with the industry side, as, as you look at this, clearly small companies uh, often where we, we talk about innovation happening, what does this mean across the spectrum? Big to small companies, uh, our, our traditional defense industrial base, what does that partnership look like? Uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit of the spectrum of companies that you see participating in this deep tech? Absolutely. So it's a big question. It basically is the whole enchilada of today's talk, but let me quickly break some things down. Look, when we entered into the late Cold War and systems for the military, especially the Air Force, became complicated, integrated systems of systems, like we call it a fighter, but what is it really? It's a stealth airplane with a complicated radar, with a complicated weapon, with a complicated mission computer, all integrated together to act as one thing. All of that integration drove a lot of risk into programs, slowed them down, which is what's led us today to programs where we put the prime, and we use that company. It's kind of ironic we're calling our programs prime programs, but maybe there's some, maybe there's some sense in that irony. We drive the mandate to the prime that sub-allocates it to companies that are providing subsystems. And the prime had to integrate it all together so that we get that war-winning capability at the operational edge. And it's, it's trendy in uh, this building over here, you see the logo, to talk badly about the primes and say, you know, whatever. Hey, we've got a war-winning Air Force today and they built it. So let's remember that. But it's, it's just, it just doesn't make sense to keep doing business that way. We once didn't do business that way. We migrated to it because technology mandated at the time. Now we can migrate from it because technology has changed again. How do we create the new relationship? We've got to adopt digital design practices. So digital engineering, uh, agile software development, including uh, containerization, Kubernetes that help us abstract code from the environment on which it runs, which will allow a lot more software companies and AI companies to engage with the Air Force and Space Force. And finally, just use open standards like commercial industry does so that you can break up parts of the program. Now, what will that do for you, a deep tech company in future? Well, you probably are not building the prime in the, in the past, prime platform. You're somewhere down in the subsystems. Well, in the past, we would work vertically with you. We would put the prime on contract and then money and, and tasking would trickle down to you. And this new paradigm that's digitally based, we're working horizontally. You've got a direct relationship with the government to plug your deep tech in, whether it is AI driven or hardware driven inside a government reference architecture that we control. Effectively, our digital modeling tools are the integrator. And that's not something we have to make up. That's coming to us uh, courtesy of commercial industries like automotive and you know Formula One racing. I can go on industries that have moved entirely digitally. We're just simply riding their coattails and learning their lessons. Well, what that will mean in defense is you having a direct relationship with us. You don't have to master defense contracting and procurement. You don't have to master integration. You simply have to master your technology and we incorporate it in. What should that mean? It should mean that our platforms, our systems become ecosystems of continual competition. If you can build a better application, a better component, a better hardware extension of our system, 
It should plug and play just like commercial technology does. Why doesn't it do that today? It is that complicated integration. It's all of those layers down and down and down that don't have the benefit of that digital technology today. That is a long answer and I apologize for it, but it is really the answer for why it is so hard to plug and play in defense systems, why we don't work with amazing agile deep tech companies today and why we have hope that we can in future. We announced just a few, just a few weeks ago, a few, almost a little over a month ago at the Air Force Association that we've already built a full-scale flight demonstrator of our next generation air dominance platform and that we're going to make it open and agile in this very way. So we're not just talking this, we are doing this and not just doing it as a side gig. We're doing it on the main stage on programs that we absolutely depend on for our next generation of dominance because without doing it, without giving you access to it, to quote Chief Brown, we'll lose. So this is an example of us accelerating change and putting at least our design money where our mouth is, and then hopefully coming soon to a theater near you, the ability for you to engage in the ecosystem that will be that platform. Can you talk a little bit about, as we look in these different deep tech areas, there's there's often the discussion you know, when the iPhone first came out or the smartphone generically, no one knew they had a requirement for this. <laughs> what does it look like in deep tech to maybe identify those things the warfighter may not know. They may not know they have a requirement. Um, how, how does that change the structure of our capability development, the way we think about doing capability development in the Department of Defense and, and the acceleration of these partnerships with the companies doing deep tech? Yeah, great question. We Right now, we're driven from a requirement to a solution. So a warfighter says, I need a thing. It flies this fast. It goes this far. It carries this much. And we build it. So it's based on the warfighter understanding what they need and telling us. With technology changing so quickly, it doesn't make sense anymore. Our process working with you should shift from being requirements-based to being opportunity-based. If we design systems that are open, that you can change technology continually, then I don't have to have a requirement. I just need a mandate from our warfighters to bring them opportunities, things they didn't even know they needed, like that iPhone. And what I have experienced about warfighters throughout my entire career in this building, so you bring them an opportunity, they will find a way to fight and win with it. In fact, the, the years that I ran the Strategic Capabilities Office, which was the you know, class for a long time, the, the classified acquisition system that the department didn't talk about, I think I, I think I created about 53 or so capabilities. Not a single one was requirements driven. They were all opportunities that were either produced within industry or produced by some strategists. And then we found industry that could make them. We took it to a warfighter and they said, absolutely. So that's how this process will work. And then the great thing about opportunities is that you don't have to wait on, you don't have to wait on us. You can bring them to us and pitch them to us. So I'm also excited about AFWorks doing the open topic solicitation as the standard way to get us ideas. And I think commercial solutions offerings, which a very successful run as part of the counter COVID campaign, that's a great way for us to open the door to just plain commercial tech that doesn't really require development for our mission. Both of those are great mechanisms to harness opportunities where there isn't a requirement. And, and for the companies that are out there, you know, we've fantastic record since F Venture started. What does it look like, the, the different modes for connecting that end user with a company out there that thinks have this fantastic idea in, in technology? Absolutely. So we'll hit this. Hey, and keep, if you've got questions on our process, keep them coming in. Today is for you. So let's break the process down. Look, uh, we owe you in calendar year 21, almost here, a calendar of events for AFWorks that's easy to understand. And if you go to the AFWorks website, you're going to see that calendar that tells you that three times per year, we've got an open door for any ideas. This is the open topics. Bring us an idea. You don't need to know your mission. So small phase one contracts, 50K, that, that start the relationship between us and your technology to help you find your mission, to find your customer and the user associated with it. 
Uh, once we have that, then we move into the phase two and the phase threes where we're growing your idea towards that mission, bringing in matching dollars from that customer so that if, if you have private investors, it shows that the customer is putting skin in the game. And hopefully that encourages your private investment partners to want to increase their investment as well. It's, it's, a, it's a better, it's a better um, indication of product market fit all the way up to the bigger bets, like the strat fives and coming soon, the tactical fund increases that'll be a little smaller than the strat fives, but still able to help you get an idea to the goal line. That, that, is, that is how you run our process. And the litmus test is ultimately, do we get you into programs of record? And I, I, I believe the Air Force will do it because I hear this being talked about outside of acquisition, the importance of bringing in commercial tech. But it all starts with just having a predictable time period to get us ideas. And you don't have to speak defense to get those ideas to us. You don't need to hire consultants or former defense officials to help you write that solicitation. A white paper where you explain your technology and your company is enough to start the relationship with us. So it, it, AFWERS is effectively finally creating a good dating app for the Air Force and Space Force uh, for working with you. And I hope that you will swipe right on us. Uh, but if we, if we don't, if you don't and you find it too hard and that is why you swipe left, then we're back to losing. Because without companies like you who have an idea and who are willing and want to work with the military, we don't have enough resource to drive global tech anymore. It is not the Cold War. And so we will simply become an Air Force and Space Force working with a smaller and smaller division of our industrial base and becoming more and more behind the times. So it's a dire way to end this question, but that really is the future if we don't make working with us easy. So I think the dating app question was uh, appropriate for the follow on you know, for industry, that's how they play. What is it internally for the Air Force? What does that look like? What kind of education is happening for the commanders, for, for the operators out there so that they understand this pairing? Is, is there an internal training that's required? What's AFWERX doing? What are we doing more broadly to make sure that, that we are interacting differently, kind of at the, at the lowest levels potentially, to bring in these new ideas? And, and maybe it's someone, you know, not in AFWERX, but across this broader ecosystem that's identifying that next smartphone. Sure. I mean, AFWERKS and the companies working with AFWERKS are actually teaching us. You are changing the Air Force and the Space Force because senior leaders who, who have grown up thinking that companies that don't have a lot of people can't make a lot of impact, you're rewriting that belief system. You, you have greater agility and the potential to move at speeds that we simply can't harness within our traditional system. So you are changing us. And so the demand for bringing in commercial systems, for bringing in opportunities instead of requirements is going up. And you can imagine what would happen when the folks that are majors and lieutenant colonels that are driving AFWERX right now, amazing heroes. Like I can, I can see Steve Lauver, uh, you know, typing questions that are coming in here. I mean, he's one of the heroes of AFWERS, Joey Aurora, Chris Benson, uh, Austin DeLorme. And these are folks that, you know, they're formidable talent within our Air Force. What happens when their generation becomes leaders and they've grown up and they don't, they're not just learning what you're teaching, but they've driven it. Watch out for us when that happens. So thank you if you have worked with us at any point over the last two and a half years, ever since, uh, over three years, ever since AFWERKS and, and AF Ventures began. Thank you. You are really changing the way we think inside this five-sided building. So there's some fantastic questions. We're going to transition here in, in just a moment into some of the specific deep tech, which I know is, is, is your main interest. One of the things that's important for the companies that are participating in this that haven't worked with government is if it is a sky shot that's out there, what are we doing to make sure that we are protecting their intellectual property to ensure that they have long-term opportunity for their return on that investment? It's a great question and keep them coming. I think after this, we'll do some questions on deep tech and then, hey, I know process questions are coming in. We will answer those as well. But look, if you've got a great idea and you're going commercial, 
the last thing you want to do is have to hire a gaggle of lawyers because the Air Force wants to get into a intellectual property ownership discussion. We know, we accept, we are not going to own intellectual property for commercial technology and dual use technology. What we're hoping to have is, is really more of a window of time advantage over our adversaries. So if you're building something that you want to sell to everyone, is there a way to sell it to us first that helps you reduce the risk of selling to everyone? Is, is, it, is it viable for you because the price point is higher than the commercial market would tolerate? Or you can't produce it in a quantity yet that can be sold to the whole world? Or is it just too risky for it to be a commercial product, but it would be okay for the military? Those are the areas that I think are really interesting. Um, you know, I, I had a company come in and, you know, they were, uh, their vision was to build hypersonic airplanes. It was like, well, that's badass, right? I mean, hypersonic airplanes, boy, jet lag is a thing of the past when you move at that speed. But you can imagine a hypersonic airplane, that's a tough challenge. That truly is deep tech. And so, you know, when we were talking with them, we never once got into an intellectual property discussion, not once. We were talking about how, well, yes, building a hypersonic airliner might be one thing, but but wouldn't it make sense to build a drone that the Air Force could use first and before you build that, that passengered airplane? Let us help on de-risking, certifying, building confidence in it. So it's similar to Agility Prime in many respects. And that's where our discussion went. So bottom line, if you're working in an area that is deep tech, more than likely, our value proposition is helping you get to a goal line earlier. And if you reach the goal line, so do we. And if we have access to that tech and, and, and you are working with us to help you commercialize, then that's an opportunity we wouldn't have had otherwise. That's how we win on this global innovation battlefield is create those opportunities that wouldn't have happened otherwise. And when I can fly at hypersonic speeds around the world, uh, Wow, boy, that's going to change my travel habits. So I'm I'm rooting on those companies daring that that big idea. So we were going to accelerate into this next transition. Uh, the first question was hypersonic. So uh, we'll, instead of going good. for that big sky shot, good good job, Steve. You're you're teeing <laughs> up really great uh, great topics in. So uh, you could not have segued better. So so instead of that big sky shot, we're going to go the other direction. Uh, quantum, let's get right. get really small um, and tell us what does that relationship look like if that becomes uh, potentially the next, the next sky shot in quantum, what's, what is that relationship? Hey, I think quantum has a great potential to be one of the next sky shots and uh, the big center point of a uh, prime program for AFWorks. And what does that look like for us? Well, you know, that's part of the fun is right now quantum is so broad and multivariate. But what do you think about when you hear quantum and a tech blog or, you know, on the news, you immediately think quantum computing and, and maybe quantum encryption, you know, qu you know, quantum keys and that sort of thing. Well, we've been talking quantum computing for a long time, and it really hasn't happened as quickly as people would have expected. And I'll tell you, we're making fantastic progress in the Air Force and both trapped ions and photonics. And we want to keep driving quantum computing, have great partnerships with IBM and with other tech giants that we'll hopefully be able to, to name soon. We want to keep driving it. But when we, when we kicked off quantum accelerator between the Air Force Research Lab and AFWorks, we wanted to shine a spotlight on all of the other kinds of quantum capabilities that we are very interested in that get very little limelight, like, like quantum sensing, uh, single photon detection, being able to look around walls. I mean, that's superhero stuff. I, I want to be able to do that. And so do our special operators. Well, that technology's it's not too far away with investment. Or what about quantum gravimeters to detect things that are heavy? So there's a whole field of quantum sensing that's not getting the kind of love that quantum computing can be. And the whole idea with our quantum accelerator was to set a target for what we call Q-Day in the Air Force, which is the day we operationalize that next quantum effect. Now, I get it, everything that we do is based on quantum mechanics. I, I am a physicist, I can't deny that. But other than lasers, I mean, we don't have a lot of phenomenology that are purely quantum mechanical. 
So the idea of Q-Day is create that next purely quantum mechanical capability and hopefully help the company that creates it get discovered, get funding, and mature through the military a technology that could ultimately change the world. Or maybe it's none of the things I'd mentioned and something we didn't know to even ask about. It's an opportunity. That's the reason for going into deep tech is I understand quantum sensing is not something I'm going to have walk through my door in six months. I'm going to have to invest over time and allow the tech to mature. But the speed at which commercial innovators are maturing tech is so much faster than our historical acquisition timeline. It seems fast to us. And that's why there's a chance for a big win-win. It's a good pivot away from hypersonics. It's a nice try, Steve, on, uh, on trying to toss me the softball. I appreciate it. But uh, Vidoff, I was able to 9G turn you. So uh, we'll, go, we'll go into 9G turns and how that might happen with uh, non-pilots in the future. I know one near and dear to your heart, uh, artificial intelligence. What does that look like? What does the relationship look like with government? Where is the, you know, the low-hanging fruit? And where is that maybe longer-term sky shot in artificial intelligence? And what, is, what does trust start to look like? Absolutely. Hey, artificial intelligence, huge proponent of. I've been trying to make it happen for years, and I'm excited to say we are finally, finally on the doorsteps of true operational AI with the advanced battle management system. That's our internet of things. It was able to shoot down a cruise missile using an AI enabled kill chain in just a few seconds with a, with an army cannon. So cannons shooting down cruise missiles, courtesy of AI, that's sci-fi stuff that just gets you excited and doesn't, uh, doesn't need to come to a, a movie theater near you. It's real and it's been done. We're happy to link the video to that. It was a really cool event. Well, that's an example of real AI coming. Last week, we, we updated software on a U-2 spy plane in flight. The next milestone we're going for is AI on the jet itself. So finally breaking down the barriers to AI by designing systems to be software secure. Here's the thing we need on AI. We need AI that is hardened against adversarial tactics. So you can imagine we're military. The second we have AI flying on our spy plane, adversaries are going to try to mess with our spy plane in ways that a human would never be fooled. But but algorithms are, you know, that are based on convolutional neural nets and the connected data, the training sets that support them might be fooled. So there's going to be a different form of algorithmic warfare that's never existed, but it will be the front and centerpiece of a new kind of, of warfare we must get good at. So we need to know how to break AI and how to make AI that is hardened against an adversary intentionally trying to break it. But that's not just a problem the military needs solved, though I, I would say we probably need it solved first. That is a problem that's also being wrestled with by every company trying to create the next generation of the Internet of Things, where things are going to move in a way that has safety implications because of AI. Self-driving vehicles, drones, that gets most of the hype and buzz. But we're also talking about changing the way machineries operate in factories to optimize output and distribution. Things that, if they're not done absolutely securely, will have implications to cost or, or more alarmingly, safety in life. Well, as long as no one's messing with that form of AI, all's well. But we all know we live in a cyber infiltrated world. We'd be naive not to think that an algorithmic form of cyber will rise up to challenge AI, to, to thwart it, and to create the same type of virus effects we have today, but they're equivalent for these algorithms. We need those, and so will the next generation of the Internet of Things. That is a great opportunity for us to play a catalyzing role and have our military mission help companies get money to develop and get to a bill of sale years before that same technology might be in the car you're driving or the drone deliver, delivering the package to your door that that company would know can't be hacked or thwarted because a, a hardened, more suspicious form of AI is, is riding on it, not the machine learning as we have it today. So if you want to read more about AI, fantastic op-ed 
in Wired over the weekend. Um, <laughs> I didn't even think about that enough. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> th- thank you. Well, I, 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 I'm supposed to write them for people to read, right? Yes, I did write a, an op-ed in, um, for Wired that came out over the weekend. We'll, we'll post a link, but it, it'll give you some interesting context about why it's been so hard for the military to harness AI. Some interesting anecdotes from history, uh, you know, going back to uh, the time that, um, you know, computers were first theorized to be able to play complicated games like chess to finally beating Gary Kasparov in the case of Deep Blue to AlphaGo beating Lee Sedol and that famous move 37 moment of game two in 2007 or 2017, all the way to where we are today with the first militarized effects happening through AI. So if you've ever wondered why it's been so hard for the military and what the strategic context uh, Hopefully, it'll be a way to catch you up really quickly. And if you're a company working in AI or an investor in companies who are, uh, we need you to help us keep crossing these goal lines. So we hope that you'll be part of this deep tech trail that we blaze. And AI, you know, AI is very much an area that's today's tech, but AI is also going to be tomorrow's tech for the foreseeable future. So it will always be a candidate for deep tech partnerships. So transitioning from the algorithm to algorithm meeting hardware, what do you see opportunities in manufacturing? What's what's happened already in advanced manufacturing, 3D printing, thermoplastics? Uh, what do you see as a progress so far and where in that space do you see potential moonshots? Yeah. Sky shots. Sky shot. I mean, hey, if we ask for sky shots and you give us a moonshot, That's we're good. not going to turn you around, right? I mean, we're... Air and Space Force work together really well, so we're not going to argue over what altitude you're playing out at. We just want to say it doesn't have to be this, I, I'm going to another galaxy to, to colonize it type of idea. It can be something that requires more time and investment than today's investment appetite uh, can, can afford. Um, in terms of manufacturing, we just hosted the department's first advanced manufacturing Olympics, and we were blown away by what companies were able to do. We had tough challenges from mailing companies boxes of parts from different airplanes with all sorts of abnormalities and asking them to scan them, to recreate them, to create processes to certify them uh, that that are independent from the machines printing them. They were exceptionally tough challenges. And uh, stuff we'll be posting um, on our uh, YouTube channels here, both Rapid Sustainment Office and AFWR. So they're amazing, entertaining watches. So we were blown away by it. Absolutely an area that could be in deep tech. And I'll tell you why what's really exciting about advanced manufacturing is it's, it's a form of manufacturing you can't undercut with cheap labor, which has happened to us so frequently vis-a-vis China. Digital engineering, digital manufacturing, tailored manufacturing, it provides a wonderful opportunity to bring things back into the country that have left, but not in a way in which they left. The manufacturing coming back isn't one for one with what left. It's better. It's smarter. It's more adaptable. It's more tailorable. And we've seen during COVID-19 the value of being able to pivot companies who make one type of thing to another. Well, that's a good capability to have in the nation in case another crisis happens, but it's an especially good capability to have and companies that are working between defense or maybe defense and commercial entities that don't need to get their manufacturing capability tied into one unique product line. That's an area that we should be driving, should be driving the trademark. If you want to know what I think the deep tech challenge is, it's it's going to be um, doing that certification, especially for safety critical functions. If it's a part and it doesn't matter from a mission perspective, whether it goes on the airplane, you know, I, I, uh, one of my first foray into this was a, a C-17 latrine cover, which has to be on the airplane for safety or sanitary reasons, but it's not going to determine whether that airplane flies safety. Certifying it is just a matter of doing stress and fracture tests and burning and melt point tests to make sure nothing nauseous or poisonous is going to be released in the case of a fire. Something that goes in that plane's engine, very different thing especially if we're making it with many different additive machines that don't do things identically. How do we know the parts meet our specs if the way they're made is coupled to the machine? 
if you can solve that problem, and many companies in the Advanced Manufacturing Olympics helped us take the first step, that is a deep tech problem that has a huge return on investment for us and most assuredly for you. So we are huge proponents of this. And I think that's a great area for us to explore. Maybe that's a good place for us to push. So you mentioned COVID, the agility uh, that we had during COVID. Transition a little bit over to uh, what we could do on the bio side, in particular, uh, telehealth. What does that look like into the future? Are there Are there places perhaps that we can explore there, uh, both for uh, folks that are deployed uh, out, out in the field, as well as just our standard uh, business practices, uh, taking care of, of folks during uh you know, non, non-conflict non times and places? I'll tell you, Vito, if I, 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 most of the time when, when someone's asked me something on technology, I've, I've spent some time thinking about it. Uh, I mean, I, that's what I do in this job. I, I do very little other than read about technology and try to apply it to our missions. But but bio and health are things I've been forced to learn a lot about, especially running the Defense Production Act work. And I still have a lot of thinking to do. We're not, we're not great on bio things in the military. We do medicine well. We're ready to go do battlefield medicine. But, but as the nation saw, this entire nation wasn't ready for a crisis like COVID-19 And we need to be ready for one in future. We need to be ready for one that's maliciously created because this is shown to be a great way to keep attention elsewhere if you want to have the ability to, you know, to do things that normally wouldn't be allowed on the world stage. This building is not ready for that, Vidoff. This is an area I really need companies and investors to bring us some big ideas and opportunities. And what I owe you is some deeper thinking on how the Pentagon engages bio. I don't know if the Air Force and the Space Force or the Natural Services to do it. The Army does a lot of the bio work, but that doesn't obviate me from doing some thinking on it. And what the stuff that I've read and learned from a lot of of principal investigators about what is possible today with synthetic biology and gene editing make me think the next strategic attack on the U.S. not likely to be from conventional or nuclear weapons, but from ones that have have never seen their likes before, except in great pandemics, but that might have characteristics that pandemics of the past never had. And if we're not ready for that kind of crisis, then this current one has taught us nothing. So I appreciate that question coming in. Whoever sent it, thank you. Uh, we're a Pentagon ready to fight with Newton's equations, with Maxwell's equations, with, which govern electromagnetism, with Kepler's equations that govern you know, orbiting satellites, uh, whatever the fundamental equations of biology are. Uh, we're not ready to fight with them and defend with them, and we need to be. So more from me on that, but is it an area that needs to be on our deep tech list? Yes. Is it an area we need you to come brief us when we don't know how to ask you smart questions or give you requirements? Yes. Is it an area that I hope I'll see some big ideas at the next open topic solicitation? Yes. Help us become bio warriors and be bio savvy. So if not directly bio, uh, can we talk a little bit, some of the fallout of COVID? Are there tool sets more now on the cyber side where we may start thinking about work a little bit differently internal to the Department of Air Force. Are there, are there potentially some, some sky shots there as we create efficiencies, maybe through this business use of AI or different approaches to connectivity? Uh, What does, what does that look like in making sure that we're getting the most out of our workforce? Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, I think AFWorks has had some of the most stellar examples of virtualizing of any organization in the Pentagon. And AFWERX was forced to do that with Pitchbowl. Remember, that, that was the week before the national emergency was declared. We had to make the call to pivot online, and, and that's how the strat buys were, were announced. So, um, And that's gone on to Agility Prime and these Ask Me Anythings and myriad other collider events, base of the future. Yeah, yeah we have learned from this, uh, but we want to do better than just doing Zoom calls. We, we really... I mean, Zoom's been great for us. I mean, Zoom's become a verb faster than Google became a verb. So, but I think we can do a lot more. And for companies that 
are helping automate business functions so that we can do things uh, with fewer people focused on back office activities. That's where our head is now. That doesn't sound as sexy as building a hypersonic airplane or a quantum sensor or some next generation AI that can't be hacked. But when you can reduce our manpower requirements, you are directly lowering our direct cost uh, for running the Air Force. So I, uh, I hope that you'll come see us too. Automation of any form is something that we need to value more in the military. We value it on the battlefield. It's time that we value it in the office as well. Perfect segue. Uh, going to the other end of the spectrum, this was kind of spun the question a bit, not looking at the tech, but one of the often received critiques of this approach to using commercial technologies, well, that's great for your business practices, or that's great for, you know, areas, uh, you know, prior to conflict. One of the questions came through, what does this look like in an IADS? Uh, are, there, are there real technologies that are out there that we see in the commercial sector that actually have applicability in some type of a contested environment? Yeah, I, um, I mean, that something we should expect with, with China's doctrine of civil military fusion. An integrated air defense system is clearly a military system. Are there are a lot of things we could imagine being uh, connected to it uh, from commercial technology to make it operate differently? Absolutely. So sensors are not things being primarily driven by military dollars, and every quarter, it seems. There's a new space company that has an ambition to put new satellites in low Earth orbit. So I think about how radars terrestrially sweeping from our airplanes, how they might work differently and better if they're connected to myriad satellites orbiting overhead. Really makes you wonder, for an Air Force that's accustomed to having stealth and a Space Force that's accustomed to being mainly classified, meaning that you don't really know where we are, you can't see us coming, and our invisibility is a huge tactical advantage on the battlefield, how that pivots when there is no hiding. Or, or maybe there is. We just need to invest a different way. You know, I, I mentioned before that we need companies to help us harden AI against adversarial tactics. Well, if you really understand that, we'd also be interested in working with you to counter AI itself. Maybe the, maybe the next generation of technology isn't trying to, to make airplanes invisible to algorithms, but just simply defeating those algorithms themselves because we understand how the, the, the mathematics that drives the AI behind it, we understand how that works. So that's an example of well, something we should worry about, a world of sensors connecting with an IADS, eyes everywhere you can't hide. But is that world of sensors, is it all being pumped in front of people looking at screens? Well, if that's the case, then you know maybe, maybe we can take that trend, right? If, if we're fighting an adversary that's not automating what they're doing. But if they are automating what we're doing, then we actually don't have to defeat the sensors per se if we're defeating the machine learning and computer vision running behind those sensors. So with every risk that we face, with every potential vulnerability, there's an opportunity. And so I hope that answers the question that was asked. That's a very real possibility that we face. In a future algorithmic warfare, an enemy is going to be trying to defeat our AI. We're going to be trying to defeat theirs. We need the best companies possible working with us so that um, we come out on top. So continuing down uh, the algorithm path, looking at digital twins, what does that look like into the future? Is, is there enough of a commercial appetite, you feel? Is there enough of a return on investment in DOD to, to go develop those digital twins, to develop the data and the infrastructure necessary to realize that return on investment? I, I, I don't, I mean, it's a, it's a tough question to answer because in the DOD, there are not rigorous standards for what terms like digital twin mean. We have them within the Air Force and Space Force. So a digital twin would, would be a, a, you know, a digital representation of a physical system that is one-to-one -one with it, at least with, with major components. If you're not claiming it's a twin of the whole system, 
of a subsystem uh, itself. Whether or not the investment would be worth it would very much depend on the system in question and what we would do with that digital twin. In the case of Formula One racing, that digital twin is where designs are explored. It's where the driver is trained. It's where the race car is optimized for the individual track so that the companies building them can build a reasonable number of cars and win on a now digitally driven race circuit. Something like that, yeah, I could see that being hugely powerful, where we're designing new systems, we're training operators before they go into the battlefield, and we're able to update systems before we have to push those updates to the physical one. If it's something that we've already built and fielded, the, the time and effort to build that digital twin might not be worth it, depending on the business case. That's really, you're really going to have to talk, you know, very closely with your Air Force or Space Force counterpart to see if there's a return from you. What I can say for anything we're building that is new, that is a from scratch development, it is absolutely worth the investment for digital twins and digital threads. In fact, we will not build new from scratch systems that are not fully digital. And if you saw our secretary's announcement about the new e-system series, that's going to be how we start. We're going to build, just like Formula One racing, we're going to build fully digital systems first, explore the trade space, train operators, so that when we do build that physical system, we know it's war winning and production quality from unit one. It's an inspiring, inspiring technology. And it's that kind of stuff that, you know, it is like the movie, The Matrix, which is why I you know, wrote our strategy and in, in, in Matrix uh, quotes and analogies and, and backgrounds. Uh, it's almost like sci-fi, except it's real and we don't have to develop the techniques ourselves. So I'm just so grateful that this technology has been matured in the commercial industry and we just have to have the vision to adopt it. So continuing that, that digital thread, obviously we can we can talk about the digital twin at the component level, at the system level. Thoughts on propagating that up to where, you know, and you can talk about a bit of the game of training our operators. Does that eventually grow? We've we had this discussion of is there is there a game prime out there where we're also playing playing the war out? We're playing out the analytics, um, and and what does that flow of data look like between these different levels? I, I'll tell you, I think we are under connected to the game industry. And I think we're, we're going to have to explore a really interesting partnership, uh, I guess, uh, paradigm with them. Because, you know, I know having a, a company build uh, a cutting edge game that can only be used by the military. I know there's not going to be a, a return on it. But the technology that, that, that undergirds video games has huge application to us. So, I would, I hope if you're out there and you are from the gaming industry or you're connected with companies who are, I'm, I'm interested in talking with you about, about how we create a model that would make sense. I would think if we were training our pilots in some video game that looked really awesome and there was some way that you could also sell that to everyone in the world that didn't undermine our security, that would be a huge selling, uh, marketing uh, aspect of your pitch, right? Hey, it's being trained, used by the Air Force for the next generation. Uh, I don't know. I think we need to be exploring that. Does it make sense for us to be flying a digital Air Force in a high fidelity sim every second of every day faster than real time to explore all the possible permutations that we could face that we could face on the battlefield? Yes, we should be doing that yesterday. And we just finished talking about AI and defeating AI. That is the only way that we're going to get our AI trained sufficiently. We're the, the operational environment we're going to face on the battlefield will never have existed before. So getting our AI ready for it and trying to harden it against adversarial techniques, trying to thwart it, we're only going to be able to do that training digitally to the best of our ability based on what we can think about, tactics we can think about. So yes, we need that if we're going to finally have R2-D2 sitting in the cockpit with us and not have R2-D2 believe everything that comes over the computer to them. And so, you know, I, I think that the U2 is going to get there first, but we're going to have a fairly trusting R2-D2 flying in that cockpit. That's okay for a demo, 
But we want a much more suspicious R2-D2 by the time we go to war. And training in the simulated environment is a great way for us to get there. So I love that idea. Whoever sent that in, it's an awesome idea. Yes, we should do it. Uh, if, if you're building it, come talk to us. All right. So we, we focused on SkyShot so far. Uh, obviously, with AFWorks internal to AFRL, uh, AFRL is one lab supporting two services. Let's talk a little bit about space, uh, in particular, space surveillance. What do you see uh, both domestically, some fantastic technologies? Uh, there's scalability that is really unprecedented. Uh, we're starting to see other countries around the world do that. How do you see the Department of the Air Force leveraging this space surveillance network? Yeah, space is an area where there's huge commercial investment, and I'm really excited. Space Force as a new service uh, inside this big department of the Air Force, which houses both Space Force and the, the Air Force proper, the Space Force has open arms to commercial tech. So I love the idea of a service and it's, its birth year. Finding commercial technology is one of its parents that's going to raise it into a dominant war fighting force. Uh, space surveillance is a great area for us to look because there's a lot of objects in space and Space Force tracks the tens of thousands of them that are in low Earth orbit. But orbitology that's much further out, like geosynchronous orbit, is becoming increasingly important to the globe. So your lives, my lives, all of it depends on orbits that you may not mention in household conversation, like low Earth orbit, medium orbits, geosynchronous orbits, sun sync orbits. But every one of those orbits is amenable to a different kind of satellite that has huge economic import, national security import. As such, we want to know what's out there. And yes, there's huge potential for us to leverage commercial investments so that where we need to make military investments, we are not duplicating what is happening naturally commercially. And more importantly, we are doing everything in our power to encourage those commercial endeavors along with access to our military mission as a way to receive recurring revenue. And there's so many other areas in space, uh, different sensing phenomenologies that, that are being done commercially that have historically been done by the military. We should be encouraging those along. Next generation propulsion, next generation space planes, next generation everything. We should have an eye on doing them commercially. On the thoughts a little bit, uh, there's been some thoughts about uh, potentially on-orbit manufacturing, things like... Uh, you know, some some type of a space based uh, solar power, any any things that are kind of on the edge or, or maybe too much of a moonshot, even the discussion that, that maybe a moonshot isn't a moonshot anymore. There are there things beyond <laughs> beyond where we'd go in the moon. Um, a Mar is a Mars shot even <laughs> that uh, inspiring anymore? Are we going on to Jupiter or, you know, I, uh, I guess you know, going out to Saturn would be, just be pretty awesome. Um, I wherever whatever heavenly body we're shooting for, which means the next big thing. Um, we're open to that. Don't let the, the title sky shots make you think that we want to lower the bar of how big we go. We just want to say, if you're there thinking, the kind of technology I'm pushing is not going to the moon or to Mars. It's just simply the kind of investment Silicon Valley would have made in years past. And that's becoming harder and harder to get the patience get over the goal line that, that we're there. We want to be your partner, but we're interested in going big as well. Manufacturing on orbit, I've seen quite a few briefs. It's a tough challenge to make the business case close, but we build a lot of really expensive satellites. So if there is a business case that closes, it's probably ours. Here's the thing we need you to think about. If you can make a part on orbit and that saves us the money of having to get it there, uh, and the reason the business case closes for us is that it's going on a really expensive satellite. It's going on a really expensive satellite. We spent a lot of time and money to build. So if you can print it, how can we prove to our warfighters that we can put it on the satellite safely? If we can answer that latter question, then the bar drops a lot lower for us to get it over the goal line. But the idea of printing satellites in space, I mean, that, that we're getting close to like 
building, you know, building a Starfleet right at that point. We're ready to have the the big space station up in the sky, and we're making stuff in orbit. We're repairing our uh, you know enterprises before they go out, uh, you know, touring the galaxy. So, but we've got to take the baby step someplace. So, yeah, I think that's a really cool idea. We would probably need to work with you on how we certify the capability, very similar to advanced manufacturing airplane parts that go for safety critical functions. But cool idea. I've even had companies uh, pitch uh, mining mining asteroids, which like that's far out, literally far out. But, you know, I see why they think the business case is going to be there. And, hey, those are the kind of things they're crazy but they're crazy in a good way. And we don't ever want to be constrained with where we go. And I would love for companies to always say for these crazy ideas, I got my first dollar from the Air Force or Space Force. They weren't afraid to take the step with us. Every crazy idea throughout history started someplace with some investors saying, yeah, I'll give that a shot. All right, back down to Earth a little bit. Uh, We've been talking about algorithms and data what do you see? Do we have the infrastructure for data? What do potential commercial partnerships look like? How do, we, how do we get to that next level where we really are able to exploit data and algorithms in the way that uh, are envisioned in the future? We are close. We really are close to getting there. That has been a just a huge limiting factor for the Pentagon and Something I, I mentioned in the in the Wired article, I think it's called "There's No Turning Back for AI in the Military." We've talked AI, and you need data, obviously, to make AI work. But we didn't have any of the infrastructure to run it, and so that's why we didn't have it. And so, in the Air Force and Space Force, we've been building that basic components of a of a tech stack and the infrastructure that allow us to promulgate it across our service. So cloud and platform, pretty cool. Our, our cloud and platform, cloud one and platform one, just won the Pentagon's highest acquisition and software award. And that is pretty unusual for a software program, an IT program to win a big ticket Pentagon award. It's typically stuff that you can take pictures of and that make you know, really cool pictures you can market to the hill and elsewhere. It's planes and ships and stuff like that. But but our cloud and software development platform won the DOD's top award. And that should tell you how far we've come. And the fact that we just did those uh, Internet of Things type demonstrations, that, that says we're at an experimental phase where we can deploy AI and data at scale to create military effects and Give us a few more months, probably probably one year total. I think we'll have those effects where they would go to war on any given day if needed. What that means for companies working in AI or any Internet of Things type capability is it's much easier to plug and play with us. So the advanced battle management system I also reference in the article, it's not a very good name. I know it's like Castle Anthrax and Monty Python. We are thinking of changing it. I float the idea of Skynet. I know it's not a good name either, but boy, it is what we're envisioning is this this net that has AI that is able to learn and adapt. And if we don't build it, our adversaries might. So we want it to be our Skynet that we have to worry about controlling, not our adversaries. Whatever we call it, all kidding aside, the fact that we are now creating it and now have opportunities to plug into it every four months will give you many more opportunities to work with us. That is why we have been talking about AI for years in the Pentagon, why Project Maven, one of my old projects from my last job, was created years ago, but had nowhere to go to operationalize. So with some real irony in the name, all of these Air Force capabilities have been in airplane mode because there's just no, there's no backhaul, there's no network to connect them to. And now there finally is, and in a way that is not good for government, but just plain good. And that opens up tremendous opportunities. And hopefully for your companies, opportunities to push the envelope, not just bring us capabilities that are available broadly commercially. That's where we are today. We're basically creating the internet for the military. whoop de doo right? I mean, we should have done that years ago. So there's no, there's no applause for this. This is just doing our jobs. 
But once we've done that, now we can start pushing the envelopes and technologies that are not ready for the IoT.com, but may be ready for the IoT.mil. One of the, you talk about Skynet, uh, I think most would have to agree, you know, when we talk about ubiquitous networks, um, I think the Air Force was certainly on the leading edge of that and created huge return on investment with the global positioning system, connecting the entire world with with precision navigation time. What do you see as the future uh, for navigation, for timing? Uh, is, is there a potential sky shot in that sector? Yeah, I think so. I do. I think I think with all of the satellites going up into low Earth orbit, the idea of, of having payloads hosted on them that help you figure out where you are locally. So you may get disconnected from a GPS satellite in a, in a war, or maybe you're just, for whatever reason, you're in a austere location and GPS is having a bad day, which it rarely does. So having a, a form of geopositioning from a low Earth orbit may help you hold onto your position so it's easier to reacquire GPS and beat down that localization quickly, which would be really important for a fully autonomous system that's navigating because of it. But hey, we've been navigating for thousands of years without GPS, so I've got to think that we can look at other things to help us know where we are in the worlds. The stars are there. Yes, we can't see them in the day, but we can build sensors who can. And I mean, think about technologies like Google Earth. I mean, why can't we teach computers based on features on the ground to know wherever wherever they are globally? I realize if they're over water, we probably need to start thinking about stars. But if they're over land, how far does something need to fly before it realizes where it is? I'm not convinced that's not a solvable problem. So, yes, we need to rediscover that navigation is not synonymous with satellites. And there are a lot of ways to know where you are in the world. Timing's a little harder, but I can imagine ways to solve that as well. So remember, GPS gives us time as well. And if you don't think timing matters for your personal lives, yeah, that's how encryption works. So that ability to pull money out of an ATM, yeah, it needs that timestamp from encryption. So if you can navigate, but you don't have a sense of truth for time, most of the way that we do global commerce shuts down. So we need alternatives for it as well. Uh, and so think the whole spectrum with us. But yes, I think those are great areas for deep tech solutions. Are they the right candidates for the next prime program? Well, that's part of why we want to do a poll with you. Uh, we think they're good ideas, but hey, we're the Air Force and Space Force. We have to have an answer for almost every contingency you can think of. Uh, but we can only focus on a handful of things for our next big moves in AFWORK. So I hope this gets your juices flowing, and I hope that you'll engage with us on social media and give us your thoughts. If you are in our positions, where is the next big bet, the next deep tech bet that you would make? What sky shot makes sense to you? Uh, the limitation of funding is really the only thing that limits our appetite for technology. It's not our enthusiasm. I think funding limits it. One other thing common among all these great technologies is they all need energy. And so there's been recently uh, this energy challenge run by AFWorks. Interested in your thoughts, are there areas with energy, uh, bringing energy to some of these, whether it be in space, uh, whether it be in some of the austere locations as we deploy, uh, thoughts on potentially wireless powering? Uh, is there a role for hydrogen? Are there other ways of maybe thinking about renewables, knowing that very often uh, getting petroleum into the battlefield is is a challenge and a constraint? I'm glad. I mean, whoever sent that in, that's a great question. When you were reading that question off, I was first thinking like energy and personal energy to drive it through the bureaucracy. <laughs> Boy, if you could power systems on bureaucracy, we would never run out of energy. No, uh, energy as in physics, as in E equals MC squared. Yes, yes. Energy is a big consideration. We are an Air Force that runs on fuel. And I think every, like every three minutes around the world, we are tanking some airplane. The sun never sets on your Air Force, and it certainly never sets on your Space Force because we have satellites everywhere. But 
But that fuel we just take as a given, right? We, the fuel happens outside the battlefield, and then we fly airplanes in once they've fueled up. Well, if you're fighting the Air Force, yeah, I'd go after that fuel. I'd go after the fuel itself. I'd go after its logistics and its supply chain. So, yeah, we can't be naive that fighting the tip of the spear is what's going to happen. We have to be prepared for the entire spear building and spear throwing process. Yes, we need to become an Air Force that values investment in energy more. Hydrogen, yes, clearly need to look at that. Uh, you know, I've been impressed with just new technologies in, in nuclear power, small micro reactors. And I know we've kind of gotten a little adverse to nuclear, but hey, its energy densities are amazing. Its emphasis in terms of investment has made safety a much higher concern in a way that would allow us to build new systems. So I think we need to be looking at that differently uh, because we're not heavily invested in the U.S., but other nations, our competitors are. And we just need to be honest about what kind of densities are going to be available. Hydrogen will give us one thing, but there's a reason why we still use hydrocarbons. They are an amazing return. The, the amount of energy output you get for the, the amount of mass that you have to put in is an amazing return. And that's why so many renewable or, or green energies are just not a, a quick replacement for what we need. Remember, we're flying airplanes faster than the speed of sound, pulling nine Gs, sending them on thousands of mile missions. We need energy that lasts. So we need a broad, we need a broad set of ideas. Now, if your energy technology doesn't power the high performing, high G turning, fast flying side of the Air Force, we're rethinking the kinds of airplanes we should build all together. Maybe you're a Maybe you have an energy sipping technology, but you can build a, a platform that that's all it needs. Well, we need ideas like yours as well. We can't just simply say, here's the kind of airplane we want. Give us the energy to do it. We have to explore both ends. And, you know, we've, we've been messing around with really high altitude systems that, you know, are either lighter than air or that go extremely slow and that are working up at high altitudes. But, have we treated them as a real part of the Air Force, a real future? Not really, but it's time for a clean sheet of paper. If we can fly it and it has energy independence, we need to treat it as a strategic capability worthy of strategic thought. Going back to the human component a bit, uh, thoughts on wearable technologies? Are there, are there things that uh, provide value for our Air Force, uh, maybe using some of the smaller technologies and, and obviously the potential commercialization for some of these? They do. I mean, that clearly applies to our mission, whether the Air Force would drive, certainly I think we would drive it for, for air-based applications and space-based if we ever get involved in putting people in space. But will we be a bigger driver of that than special operational forces or the Army? I don't really see us being the big mover shaker for wearables, but I would love to to work with the Army, the Marine Corps, and Special Operations Command on it. I think we would be a good leverage of it. Now, if you're having difficulty seeing any other partners of the government, would we would we shy away from being the driver of amazing new uh, wearable biometrics? Not at all. Bring it to us. If we're your easiest conduit into the government. We will make those connections. We will be match.mil. We will even fund you ourselves. But in terms of who your real mission owner would be, if it wasn't unique to flight or our missions, I feel like the requirements that would come from the Army and Special Forces would be a, a step beyond where we would be. But it'd be cool to get you started. And, uh, you know, I, I said, I, I'd still, I still think it'd be, be fun to see, you know, where those, those mission owners would take the tech. So it's kind of where the, I think the Air Force, we, we procure the same, the same pistol as the Army. Right? The Army, that is such a big deal, what, what, you know, what hand, what sidearm they use. And so we simply just, just buy it alongside of them. I think this would fall into that. It's an area I'm personally really, really interested because I, I don't think we have brought a lot of science into the operator themselves. We expect them to be their own troubleshooter using their experience and instinct. I think we can give them a lot more data 
to help them understand. I mean, you're a pilot, Vidoff. When you, when you, I mean, you've got to have an instinct for whether you're having a good day or a bad day based on experience. But wouldn't you like to get all those readouts to say, you know, it looks like I'm a little dehydrated right now. Oh, and I am, rather than just have to do it based on your Definitely. years of flight experience. So yes, we need it. And if it's something that conveys, especially to aviation, we'd love to drive it. So there are, there are a few more questions, a little bit on process before we jump into that, but it's over 10 minutes left here. Last, last tech pieces maybe that, that we haven't touched on that, that really excites you that, that maybe we would look into. Supersonic. The, the, supersonic. All right. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, look, I, I look, it's exactly, you know, we were so delighted to announce those partnerships with the, quiet supersonic travel companies because it's like agility prime. If you're building something that flies, come build it with the Air Force. And we would love, love to help trailblaze how we get systems like that certified. And what a cool thing to think about building the next generation of, of executive airlift, but not one that's constrained a mock point something flight. So super cool ideas. And we're super happy to be partnered with them. I can only think that before you as a private citizen hop on board a supersonic passenger jet or a supersonic Learjet, that if you knew that the Air Force had been flying them for years and using them for our executive transport, that that would make you a lot more comfortable getting on board. So I think there could be a great partnership uh, for that type of potential prime program or sky shot program. I think it can be done. I think the tech is there to make quiet supersonic travel possible. And I think we could be a great partner in getting it over the goal line. But don't don't let, as we put out our polls, we're going to come with what we think is low hanging, but that's based on what we see from companies we talk to, from investors we talk to. Doesn't mean we know what you're working on. So if what you're looking at, what you're working on, isn't in any of our polls, then please reach out, I, whether you do it through social media or do it through just calling our front, if, you, if we still use the phone for phone calls anymore, if you want to call our front office and Air Force acquisition, if you want to drop us an email, send a line to AFWorks, don't presume we know where the next big thing is. We will put ideas out, but the, the, our, some of our best days in the job are where we're surprised and where we've got an idea where we say, huh, you know, I just never thought of this before. I won't say any of them because most of them are pretty special and peculiar to the companies driving them. We love those companies. We love to work with those companies. Uh, be one and help us have one of those good days. As we transition a little bit back to a few of the process discussions and maybe a couple of things uh, to share at the end uh, on on hiring and on December event, a little bit, so microelectronics we've discussed a bit, um, but as we look at things that aren't necessarily end use items, um, as we think about modularity and plug and play, how, does, how, does, how do you see that? Is there a place for a prime in that? Or if not, how do we drive the business practices uh, where some of these subcomponents uh, some of the, the, these ideas of modularity uh, start to take form so that we actually are able to, to energize and bring forward uh, those smaller subsystems. There absolutely is a potential sky shot or prime program, prime in the AFWORK sense within microelectronics. We operate on trusted microelectronics. Historically, we have done that through trusted foundries. If there is an alternative way to build trust in the systems. Hey, zero trust right now is a tech trend that's going very rapidly through software development. If there is a way to bring the analog of zero trust into hardware, then absolutely we want to know. That would be a no-brainer SkyShot program. We have our own investments at Rome Laboratory, which is part of the Air Force Research Lab, doing precisely this we would love to connect companies with similar ideas to them so that we can build trusted microelectronics that do not have to be built in a foundry that we control every aspect of the business. It's a big deal. Think about the amazing Air Force and Space Force that, that we have today. What actually makes it work are tons and tons and tons of silicon-based devices on it. 
And so the ability to transition to a more globalized supply chain without the fear of the risk that that globalized supply chain enters into the equation would be an amazing sky shot. So no, it doesn't have to be an in-state item. It just has to be a component that plays a strategic role that needs a more patient investment partner. And is that something that just makes sense for an Air Force partner? Well, no. I mean, that form of trusted microelectronics, if it was good enough for one of our drones, wouldn't you want that in your self-driving vehicle on the airplane that's flying in future, whether it's subsonic, supersonic, or hypersonic, or the drone delivering that heavy package to, to your home? Yes, you, you are going to want it to be a more trusted form of microelectronics than just something that might be operating on an entertainment device. So on all of these potentials for every technology that I've been able to think about, um, it's really hard not to think of a commercial application. Stealth, we always hold up as being something we're gonna have to continue to invest in as military unique, but maybe one day there'll be a use of stealth commercially that we're not even aware of today. Bottom line, if you're building it, we're just as focused on helping you think through and achieve your commercial objectives. Because if we pull you into a defense unique orbit or a defense unique flight plan, to give the Air Force analogy, we failed. We've put you into the old acquisition paradigm where we are one fifth of this nation's opportunity in terms of R&D. Our success has got to be staying in the dual use global um, application space where we tap 100% of what our nation is investing in and where, to be frank, other nations are investing too. We'd, we'd love to tap their resources for our mission. And that is certainly not how the Pentagon thinks today. Competing uh, in global investment Ah, we like to be the only investor. I don't think that has to be the case in future. These are the radical things that we're talking about in the Air Force. So nothing's really out of bounds right now for us. This is a great place to bring us radical ideas. You know, radical uh, comes from the, I think it's Greek word that means root or Latin word that means root. And I know that because as a mathematician, uh, we still call the square root sign the radical. Well, well, radical thinking is really the root of the Air Force. It's what birthed it. It's what birthed the Space Force. And we're open to radical thinking. And even if we've said it's not our policy to fill in the blank, technologies often change our policies. And changing technologies force our, techno our policies to change. So help us to ev evolve as the times do. And Vidoff, I know we're coming up on time. So should we talk a little bit about December event and uh, the Absolutely. poll we're going to do. So, hey, we want to do another engagement with AFWorks and announce our next Prime program. Agility Prime, our flying car program with over $100 million of government investment. We're going to have some big announcements to make about that program in December. We are excited about the partnerships we're building, but we think that our next deep tech program, we should have enough thinking and funding and ideation behind to announce it as well. So we hope that by the time we get to December, we'll be able to tell you the next prime program is fill in the blank prime. And hopefully you'll help us on a cool name, but we don't want to presume that, that we know what the right idea is that we're going to be talking about it between now and December. We want to solicit your ideas. And so what we'll be doing uh, today, uh, this afternoon, is putting out a poll with some of our ideas. Um, I'll do it from my Twitter account. We're about to post that up for you to see. In fact, uh, Brian, if you wouldn't mind, could you go ahead and post that so folks can see it as I keep giving the audio? So we'll post a poll where you can give us your vote, your comments on some of our ideas for the next Prime program. But if we're missing an idea that you think ought to be there, then we're going to have links to talk with us on social media. You can talk to me directly. You can talk to AFWorks. You can use old school like phone and email if you'd like. Whatever mechanism you feel comfortable with, we'll keep the discussion going uh, until we understand where the most enthusiasm and opportunity is. 
And then this December, we'll be ready to talk about what the next deep tech sky shop program uh, is going to be and, and hopefully build the same enthusiasm we've had for Agility Prime. Uh, I hope that today has been of some use. You know, we, we've talked so much about process. You've asked to talk about tech. Clearly from the questions, there's still a lot of question about process. I hope that we've continue to pull the veil back. If you have another burning question, please, please go to the AFWorks website. We are trying to put all the information and questions that we've answered there so that you can keep finding them. Our calendar of events is there. That's how you get ideas to us. You can find out more about Agility Prime and our Prime programs, and we'll have all of the details from the polls posted there so you can follow along. Um, so make it your central point to learn about what we're doing in commercial tech. But as long as these Ask Me Anythings are helpful to you, we will keep doing them. We'll keep answering questions. We'll talk about whatever technologies are on your mind and hopefully continue evolving into and becoming your government investment partner of choice. Uh, I'm just really pleased with how far we've come, but and uh, in an ecosystem, you can never say, hey, I've evolved enough to survive indefinitely. Evolution is a continual process. And right now with the tech trends we face, we've got to evolve faster than we ever have. You may have heard me. I love to use the, um, the, the Mike Tyson quote. You know, it was one of our great philosophers uh, that everyone has a plan until they're punched in the mouth. And that is true unless you are the person that did that mouth punching that person does not have a plan. So although we're talking about evolving to be able to stay ahead of these tech trends, we'd ultimately like to be able to drive a few and be that disruptive mouth punching force that forces an adversary to respond to us and buys us time to go and make investments in that next area of deep tech. So this is gonna be a discussion we have to have again and again. And deep tech, we want you to think of it and the Air Force and Space Force as being a, a natural symbiotic relationship. And I'll just say up front, I'm excited about the way that, that private investors have embraced us and ask you to keep dialoguing with us until we get the process right. Vidoff, just wanna thank you publicly for continuing to take AFWorks to the next direction, the next level and its new direction. And for all the AFWorksers, so I don't have a good name, but all the AFWorks nation tuning in, hey, thanks for what you are doing for the Air Force and Space Force. It is making a huge, huge difference. You are teaching the Pentagon to think differently. So thank you for that. And we're hiring. So if you're interested, please apply at afworks.af.mil. We are growing the team. It's an exciting team to be on. Dr. Roper, thank you for joining us today and look forward to seeing you all in December, uh, if not for another Ask Me Anything before then.